Tonight's winners, Ross Van Meter, Fun Fly Zone, Marilyn Jensen, Admissions, Main Gate North, Linda Gamedinger, Admissions, Main South, Amanda Niles, Home Built Parking, and Ryan Elliott, West Ramp. You must know by now that we are being mainstreamed. Yes. They're probably still waiting to have their camper pulled out of the mud, but eventually they'll get. Uh... Other than M&Ms and Bows, we owe a debt of gratitude to the media streaming people. We are now, uh, the universe is now exposed to my ramblings. And if anybody wants to watch without being here, you can check it out on www.airventure.org slash webcams. You look under theater and lots of stuff is listed there. You are proud of it. I have to be, admit to being biased. The NASA Knights are my very favorite. We have people that we have had a relationship with a long time, John and Carlos, and we have always been granted the opportunity to have a real space suit on stage and look at the models they came up with at the last minute. And In the theater, we have a favorite astronaut. When he came here, he was always camping with his chapter of EAA, about 10 miles that direction. So I either would take him by Ray's Volkswagen or a golf cart or borrowed my partner in crime's car and drive him to his campsite. He was director of astronaut training and everything else. He's an EAA board member. I asked him whether he wanted to be called a former astronaut and like an actor, you get older and older, you're still an actor. He's still an astronaut. Please welcome one of our favorite people, Charlie Precourt. Can I have that? Yes. Well, that's yours. I stole it. You're fine. <laughs> well, we're going to have some fun tonight. How you all doing? All right. Fantastic. Wow, this is exciting. We're looking at space in the rearview mirror, and we're going to have fun with that. And we're also going forward, and we're going to hear some of that tonight, too. Um, I'll give you a little bit of how we're going to do the show. Uh, this is a two-part uh, setup, and we have, to begin with, uh, some folks who worked on the lunar lander and talk a little bit about the LEM, uh, and I'm going to bring some folks out that are going to help us with that. They're very interesting people, and uh, I think you're going to really enjoy that. We also uh, will have questions from the audience uh, that will come from the voice of God, Chris Henry, who uh, is up in the, the booth there. At the appropriate time, I'll call for your questions that have been collected throughout the day, and uh, we'll take those as we go. Uh, I'd also like to, to say that my other role here tonight, uh, I work for Northrop Grumman Company. Grumman, of course, was uh, the producer of the LEM during the Apollo program, uh, and we're still involved in space in supporting Northrop, uh, supporting NASA, and at Northrop Grumman, I run the rocket motor division, and Northrop uh, sponsored the event this evening. We're very proud to have been able to do so. Uh, so thank you. The first uh, guest that I'd like to introduce tonight is NASA's Chief Technologist, uh, Doug Terrier. Would you join us, Doug? So Doug is NASA's Chief Technologist, which is way up there in the stratosphere of the leadership of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. He uh, spent many years at the Johnson Space Center Engineering uh, Division where he worked on the Orion crew module, and he's also formerly with the Lockheed Martin Skunk Works, so thanks for joining us. Doug's going to share where we're going in the future. We also have a retired Grumman engineer from the days of the LEM, the original LEM, uh, Dick Smith. Dick, would you join us? So Dick uh, worked 
on the LEM, both the ascent and descent, uh, through manufacturing engineering, basically was involved in everything about the LEM, and I think you're going to be fascinated by some of that history. Next, we have a historian that is just fascinating with some of the research he's done, uh, Robert Godwin. Rob has done some of the most incredible work with uh, archive footage from the Apollo missions that has been regenerated and he did some of the first composite uh, imagery where you see both the control center and the crew on in space simultaneously on the screen, improved on the quality, brought it to HD level quality and you're going to see some of that tonight. In fact, some of what we're going to show you tonight has not been released anywhere else. It'll be released for the first time here. So we look forward to that. Very cool. And finally, we have NASA's historian, Bill Berry. Would you join us, Bill? So Bill and I go way back. When I was at NASA, we worked together, and he has uh, been the NASA historian for about 10 years now, which is an extremely important job, keeping track of what all has been going on and is going on. Uh, prior to that, he had spent a tour over in Europe representing NASA, and we're delighted to have him here tonight, too. So thank you, Bill. Appreciate that. So, and as you all know, we'll go through uh, the LEM here, and of course, uh, we will transition to Joe Engel and Mike Collins uh, about halfway through the night, and we're, we'll introduce them a little bit later, but I want to start with the LEM story to get us all kicked off here, and to do that, I'm going to invite Doug Terrier to come to the stage, to the podium, and talk to us a little bit uh, about NASA's current plans uh, as a kind of a precursor for the rest of the discussion because we're taking the knowledge from the past and we're applying it into the future and the future is really exciting because we're going back to the moon. Doug. Thank Thanks Charlie. Good evening everyone. So um, yeah, we're going to spend most of the evening talking about what we've done in the past, the amazing accomplishments of Apollo, specifically this panel on the lunar module. But I wanted to start off by telling you what we're doing, building on that legacy, the exciting programs that we have in front of us. So that's something called Artemis, which is actually, if for those of you who pay attention to mythology, that's the, that's the twin sister uh, of Apollo. And the Artemis program, we're going to have even more exciting challenges in front of us, more pushing the boundaries of, of exploration in space. And all of you probably in this audience know better than most that what the Apollo generation accomplished really helped to establish U.S. leadership in space, but more importantly provided a host of technology developments that have benefited all aspects of our lives, certainly in aviation and space, but throughout our entire um, ecosystem and the economy. We expect to do exactly that again as we push forward with the Artemis program to create a whole new uh, landscape of technology that will again find its way into everything from our medicine into our home-built aircraft and we'll all benefit from that. So let me start off by a, a short movie introducing the Artemis program. If we could cue that, please. Fifty years ago, we went to the moon. We called it Apollo. What many people don't know is that Apollo had a twin. She was a woman named Artemis, goddess of the moon. We are returning to the moon. As a new generation of explorers. This time, to stay. And to prepare to achieve humanity's next giant leap of sending the first human missions to Mars. We believe our course will redefine what is possible. That we would discover life-saving, earth-changing science. And that the challenges ahead will inspire generations. This is our manifest. For all who wonder if we could return. For all who dreamed of pressing beyond. This is your calling. We go for all of America. We go. We go as the Artemis generation. We go. So if I could have the next the slide, please. So I want to say that you know you are in fact you are you're my boss, right? I, I represent NASA, 18,000 uh, civil servants, and uh, about 50,000 contractors across this country that work to support our space program. And our goal in life is to extend 
human presence in the solar system to create new science and technology, but ultimately to, to establish American leadership and to provide new science and technology to benefit all of us. Really appreciate you guys being here tonight to hear about what we've done and what we're doing. On Artemis, we have been charged by the President of the United States to return humans to the moon by 2024. And very notably, we've been, we've been specifically planning the Artemis program as the first hu human mission that will have a, women, a woman crew. Um, so very exciting, right step. We've been very fortunate at NASA that we enjoy bipartisan support and none more than we have from this administration. I can tell you personally, Vice President Pence has been in the building with us at headquarters one, at least once a month. He's been with the team personally, watching what we're doing, encouraging us and providing the support. And we have great support from Congress across the board. So we're very grateful for that. Could I have the next slide, please? So I want to tell you just briefly about Artemis and what that entails. And it's important to point out, a lot of people, of course, are familiar with the Apollo missions. We had six missions that landed on the moon, 12 humans walked on the moon. We have learned, as I said, an incredible amount, both about the moon from the samples we provided and the geology we conducted there. But more importantly, any time we try to get humans off this planet, it is an extremely challenging environment. All of you that are aviation enthusiasts will understand how important mass is. In an airplane, weight, trying to keep everything light, it's an order of magnitude more important in order to get off the planet out of the gravity well. And we've, as I said, have to develop new tech capabilities to do that. In Artemis, we're going to do something different. Think of Apollo as the first sort of uh, prospecting mission where we went. We stayed for a few hours initially and a couple days at the end. Artemis is about a long duration, sustainable presence on the moon. And we're going to do that in a way that teaches us how to utilize the resources on the moon and to, to provide oxygen and fuel in the long term to sustain a, a working presence on the moon. We really need to think about cislunar space as the next frontier. Many of you probably realize that we've spent the last century um, really growing aviation into what is today now a $10 trillion global economic concern in which the United States has leadership. Cislunar space is the next frontier. It is vitally important that the United States maintains its leadership both economically and strategically in cislunar space. It is expected that we'll have a multi-trillion dollar economy in space. Today, we have about 400, trillion, 400 million dollar, um, billion dollar rather, economy in, in space in terms of comm and GPS and everything else. We expect that to grow into the trillions as well. Next slide, please. Now, I'll just give you one quick preview about Artemis and then we'll, we'll, we'll um, talk, start talking more about what we've done. This builds on the heritage of Apollo and everything we've learned. But again, we're, what we're gonna do over the next decades is a series of mission where we build up an outpost around the moon called a gateway, a command post, if you will. Think of it as a, a small, interna uh, like the International Space Station on a smaller scale, but it provides an outpost from which we can run missions down to the surface of the moon and back up. The intent is to have reusable, serviceable uh, vehicles that in the long term, we can provide a fuel depot, if you will, at the gateway as a, a node on the way to the moon and eventually onto other uh, points in the solar system. So really excited about this. And I think it's really important to, to know that what we're doing here is more challenging because we're talking about sustainable long-term ha habitats. Um, Apollo is basically was devised as a really challenging mission, uh, sort of, but think of it more like a camping trip. You pack everything you need for a couple days, bring it with you, and then bring it back. We can't do that for long-range missions, certainly not for sustainable missions to the moon, and certainly not for missions onto Mars, which are multiple years. So we're going to learn how to live and work off the environment, and that's what this program is really about. So look forward to your questions and having a great conversation this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. That's pretty exciting, and thanks for sharing that with us. You know, the, the lander, uh, when we started the program uh, with Apollo, we had planned to fly the lander on Apollo 8, right? And it was, it was late, so I think one of the boldest moves that NASA made was to switch the logic in the program to fly Apollo 8 around the moon. Uh, it was the first flight of the Saturn V, first crew to ever leave low Earth orbit on a first flight of a vehicle. Uh, the first crew with Borman to and level to, to make a circumnavigation of the moon and to, to photograph the Earth rise that we've all seen. And, uh, and they recovered nicely from the lander being late. You can tell us a little bit about that, I'm sure, Dick. But um, maybe we're a little bit late again here now with that bold date for 2024. 
However, I think we've got a pretty good start, don't we? With uh, we've had the, the legacy of the the Lem from uh, the Grumman Lem from from uh, the Lunar program for Apollo, but we also had the Altair program back in about ten years ago. So we got a lot to build on, and we've got an exciting uh, few years in front of us. So um, what I'd like to do is, you know, the lander is very important uh, because they don't have an atmosphere on the surface of the moon or around the moon, so we have to propel ourselves to the surface. Um, it's a, a, kind of like a hover down, but we're using the thrusters of the, the, the LEM motor to get us to the surface and then back off again. So it's very challenging. Um, and what I'd like to do is show a brief video here that kind of describes what we call the power descent phase of the landing, and then we'll get into how we went about solving that problem. So if we could show that video, please. The Apollo 11 Lunar Module Eagle, flown by Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, took about 12 and a half minutes to go from its orbital speed of nearly 6,000 kilometers an hour to a soft touchdown on Mare Tranquillitatis. This was the first Apollo landing, and it would prove to be the most arduous. Prior to its descent, Eagle was orbiting the moon around the lunar equator in an east to west direction. This orbit's low point was only about 16 kilometers in altitude, a little over 50,000 feet, and would occur about 500 kilometers east of the landing site. Here, Eagle's main engine would be ignited to begin the descent to the surface, an event called Power Descent Initiation, or PDI. Eagle's problems began even as the spacecraft appeared from around the moon's limb. It had been fitted with metal sheets below its maneuvering thrusters to protect its lower section from their hot exhaust, but these were interfering with the reception pattern of its dish antenna. Also unknown to the astronauts, an error in their trajectory had moved the probable landing point six kilometers downrange of its intended spot and nearly into unplanned territory. Once the burn began, further difficulties would mar Eagle's final descent to the surface. The majority of the descent was controlled by the onboard computer using one of three programs stored in its memory. The first, P63, was run nine minutes before PDI and it would continue for a further nine minutes. Its function was to start the engine and control the braking phase. The first three minutes after PDI were flown with the windows facing the surface. This allowed Armstrong to time the passing of landmarks and make a crude judgment of their trajectory. Armstrong then turned Eagle around to have the windows face upwards. Now the landing radar could see the surface and feed accurate altitude and velocity data to the computer. With about three minutes remaining, control of Eagle switched to P64 and the start of the approach phase of the descent. Eagle pitched forward to a more upright attitude, which gave the crew their first view of the landing site. It also allowed the computer to indicate where on the surface it intended to land, and it gave Armstrong the opportunity to move that point if he thought it unsuitable. About 600 meters out, control was transferred to P66. This put Armstrong into the control loop letting him adjust Eagle's attitude and rate of descent as he flew helicopter-like to the surface. So that's the how, and uh, Bill, maybe a little bit before we get into details of the design, uh, because they had a, a long trajectory, Neil had to take over and get into a field where there were craters that he wasn't expecting, right? Yeah. How did that transpire? The, uh, well, of course, Charlie, uh, the, uh, as, they're, as they're coming down there, they're, as, the, as shown in the video, they were, they were long and, uh, and they were landing in an area that they weren't used to, or they weren't, weren't quite expecting, they didn't have as good a, intelligence on. Um, and as they, as they did a pitch over, uh, Neil quickly recognized that in fact they were heading toward a crater, and that's this problem number one. He's got other problems that are going on we'll get into later, I'm yeah. sure. But uh, he sees the crater, um, and so he's, I can't land in the crater, and then the crater surrounded by this boulder field. And, and, and you don't want to land the lamb on a boulder field, so you know, they were about the size of small cars. Uh, so uh, he had to quickly readjust, and so uh, he basically went into hover mode 
and hit the gas and zoom sideways to get over those craters and, and, and get down to the ground. And of course, all this time, he's burning fuel, particularly when you're hovering, and uh, he starts running low on gas. So it, it, it was a tricky maneuver. About 15 seconds of fuel left when he touched down. Uh, pretty amazing. Rob, would you uh, walk us through, you have some slides here that talk about the choices of how we got to the moon. Sure. We have things called the Lunar Direct, Lunar Orbit Rendezvous, or Earth Orbit Rendezvous. Tell us a little bit of how we got to the actual architecture of getting to the surface. Absolutely. I don't know if my microphone You're good. is working. Yeah, okay. Um, the first slide that you're seeing here is the uh, design for Earth Orbit Rendezvous, which was preferred by the rocket team, Von Braun's rocket team in Germany, uh, that came over from Germany at Huntsville. And the one on the left you see in that slide is uh, Von Braun's design for this Earth Orbit Lander, uh, Earth Orbit Rendezvous Lander that would use, take as many as 30 people up into orbit. And they would, they would actually fuel it and stage it in, in, Earth, in Earth orbit, which you see in the center slide there. And the bottom slide is uh, the Project Horizon moon base, which they had proposed to build using this system. But essentially, it was going to use uh, many Juno 5 rockets, about a dozen of them, that would create this assembly system in, in low Earth orbit and then fly the lander to the moon. We go to the second slide. Uh, I have Lunar Direct, which was favored by quite a few people, particularly a guy called Milt Rosen. And uh, top left in that slide, you'll see is the US Air Force's design for a Lunar Direct lander called Project Lumen, which was from 1958. That would have used a large Titan fluorine-powered booster. The big booster in the middle you see in yellow and black is the is Nova, which they couldn't build. It was too expensive. They didn't even have a building big enough to build it in. And then top right, you're seeing NASA's choice for Lunar Direct, which was uh, uh, from the Fleming Committee in 1961. And you can actually see the top right slide showing it coming into land backwards, almost sort of sliding in on, on a, a skid, which was uh, not very preferable. Um, the next slide is the ultimate choice was Lunar Orbit Rendezvous. Top left slide uh, image in this slide is what's called Project Malar, which came out of the Chance Vought Company in Dallas, Texas which was the first one that actually had a command module, service module, lunar module, and uh, using a thing called a translunar injection stage. That plan was handed over to NASA Langley in 1960 and became Project Malir, which you see bottom left and in the center. You see these three uh, economy plush and, and uh, very shoestring landers in the middle. That was then handed over to the Space Task Group in Houston, the advanced vehicles team, and you start to see that lander evolving on the right-hand side, particularly the bottom right-hand one, which has this sort of helicopter bubble leaning out over the front because they began to realize you couldn't see the, the landing site if you came down in a cone-shaped lander. And then, of course, this was the method that was chosen. And then the next slide, please, um, shows the competition that took place in 1962. Top left is the Chance Vought, Vought design for the lunar lander, which was actually the first one seen by the American public. It was in the New York Times in the summer of 62. The Convair one in the center there, which had this strange pointy nose sticking out of it, which was actually a movable docking system. Top right is North American Aviation's version, which was the one that President Kennedy was seen standing in front of when he made his speech in Houston. Bottom left is Boeing's design, which originally had three legs, went to four legs, and was actually the first one that put a, a ladder on the leg, believe it or not. And then bottom right, of course, was Grumman's first choice for their design, which had five legs and a spherical pressure vessel, four windows, and uh, an elevator on the front that would have taken the astronauts down to the surface. And then the last slide, please, is the evolution of Grumman's design, which we're here to talk about right now, and I'll, I'll hand it back to you. So we had a pretty good competition of five companies yeah. then, and we're back in it all over. That's pretty cool. Yeah, the, the best parts out of those five designs, well, there are actually more than that, but those five designs, the best parts of those were then willingly handed to Grumman to take those parts that were good so parts. <laughs> a little bit more about, you talk about these terminologies, Earth orbit rendezvous, so you're putting the pieces together in Earth orbit and then carrying them on to the lunar orbit and landing or a lunar orbit and or a lunar direct, why did the lunar orbit rendezvous win out? Well, in the end, it was, it was uh, easier to use one large booster, but when Von Braun was proposing to use a dozen Juno 5s, the Saturn V didn't exist, and there was no indication that it might ever exist, a, a big enough rocket that could take the whole system to the moon in one go. 
So ultimately, when, when the F1 engine was approved in the late 50s, and then the Saturn V was approved, then they had the lifting capability to take a single system using you know, command module, service module, lunar module, to lunar orbit, which would then allow them to do this module that was specifically designed to land. So, Dick, it must have got pretty exciting once Grumman was picked to build the LEM then, and you were um, involved in basically the whole thing. Well, <clears throat> I joined them uh, early on, and the, the engineering that went into uh, the early versions, uh, there are a lot of things to learn, and one of them was that the initial cockpit idea was similar to a helicopter. Um, and it had positions of seated, seating uh, like two pilots. And, but Grumman had a weight limitation given by NASA, and it was around 30,000 pounds. And we were just sailing right past that. Uh, it, it, it was out of, out of control as far as weight. And uh, so there was a, a, a big brain bashing type of thing going on with the crew of provisions people under John Rigsby and Gene Harms in that group. And somebody came up and said, why do we have to sit? <laughs> why can't we stand? And so the next day they Especially spent, in one-sixth gravity in a lunar mm -hmm. environment, right? Right. And a short duration. Yeah. You know, not a long time. So the next day they spent... Everybody just went with that idea and they came up with drawings and so forth. And then uh, uh, Tom Kelly went to Houston and presented it to NASA. And uh, NASA said, show, show them what we came up with. And basically, they had both thought of the same idea almost jointly. And uh, the astronauts liked it, and they worked on it, and uh, they refined the idea. How would they be positioned? How would they keep themselves anchored and everything inside the, the yeah. module? So that's kind of how that So evolved. some of those complications were why it was late for Apollo 8? Yeah. Yeah. So, and, and then the rest is history. Where, yeah. you know, the folks in, at headquarters had to decide. Well, we're going to send Frank um, Borman and his crew around the moon without the lemon. We'll check out the lemon on nine. Right. Right. Pretty amazing. Yeah. So, Bill. Right. Of course, Charlie. The, the big reason why the lunar module was so late is that that decision we made about how to get to the moon, the mode decision, right? Mode M O N M O D E mode decision. You know, Earth orbit rendezvous, orbit rendezvous. Just the basic yeah. choice. That that choice didn't get made until 1962. Ah. We were already starting to, to design the command module in late 1960, um, and so the lunar module starts way behind. It's one of the more complex systems, and it starts later than everything else. So it, it winds up having to be the pacing item for the program. So, and then Dick, later on, um, the LEM becomes the lifeboat to get Apollo 13 home with right. Jim Lovell's crew, right? Yeah. And uh, we're going to show a little clip here uh, from the movie, uh, Apollo 13. Let, we'll come back to you and you can tell us whether it's true or not. Okay. <laughs> okay, people, listen up and just a little time. I want you all to forget the flight plan. From this moment on, we are improvising a new mission. We'll, Sorry, we'll get somebody to look at that. All around. How do we get our people home? They are here. We turn them around, straight back, yes. direct abort. No, 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 We get them on a free return trajectory. It's the option with the fewest question marks for safety. I agree with Jerry. Use the moon's gravity, slingshot them around. No, the LEM will not support three guys for that amount of time. Apparently, holds. I mean, we've got to do a direct abort. We do an about face, we bring the guys right home right now. Get them back soon, yeah. absolutely. We don't even know if the Odyssey's engines even work, and if there's been serious damage to this spacecraft. They blow up and they die. That is not the oh, argument. We're we talking on. about time, oh, not whether or not these guys oh, 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 are oh, 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 this for you. Okay, hold it. Let's hold it down. Let's hold it down, people. The only engine we've got with enough power for a direct the board is the SPS on the service module. What well, Lovell has told us it could have been damaged in an explosion, so let's consider that engine dead. If we light that thing up, it could blow the whole works. It's just too risky. We're not going to take that chance. In fact, the only thing the command module is good for is re-entry, so that leaves us with the LEM, which means free return trajectory. Once we get the guys around the moon, we'll fire up the LEM engine, make a long burn, pick up some speed, and get them home as quick as we can. Gene, I'm wondering what the, what the Grumman guys think about this. 
We can't make any guarantees. We designed the limb to land on the moon. Not fire the engine out there for course correction. Well, unfortunately, we're not landing on the moon, are we? I don't care what anything was designed to do. I care about what it can do. So let's get to work. Let's lay it out, okay? Uh, Dick, I saw you shaking your head over there. <laughs> All bogus. <laughs> little, All bogus. A little bit of Hollywood. They're making those North of Gr uh, the Grumman guys look like they don't, they're not in the game here. What's going on? Well, that's, that's Ron Howard and movie making. <laughs> <laughs> so how did it Gene come Gene Franz told us four years ago that bothered him more than anything else in that whole Is that right? Yeah. movie. Yeah. So in... I can only imagine that what really went on is everybody pulled together and said, let's go. Uh, Tom Kelly was up at MIT in a, in a program, that, uh, Advanced Management. He got the call in the middle of the night. He ran to the airport, got a private flight back to Grumman. He's walking across the parking lot to Plant 5, and he sees all these people. This is early morning hours, and they're all walking toward the building. He said, what's going on? They had all got the word. They came from home. They didn't care if they got paid. They just wanted to be part of supporting that. And I'll tell you, they worked so hard in support. And I was in the background of that. Mm -hmm. I was a gopher. Mm -hmm. But I was certainly part of it and knew what was going on. And nobody worked harder. And when they came back and you saw those parachutes open, I saw a hundred men crying. And it was a really very emotional yeah. time. And uh, we were so proud that we did that. Well, you got to have some tension in Hollywood, right? And <laughs> make a movie, movie out of things like that. So, um, for all of you, just uh, let's talk about some of the challenges of the design and how we overcame them and and uh, how that teaches us about going forward. Um, any of you, Dick, you want to think about some oh, of the things to... The major problem in delaying the lunar module, uh, yeah, maybe a, the late design concept, but the leaks they had with all the supercritical uh, liquids on board, there was no flange type, seal type that they could make not leak. For and, all the liquid propellants. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, uh, so we were using hypergalls or... What kind of propellants were we using? Uh, they were... Uh, was it hydrazine? Or yes. Yeah, okay. And they finally realized the only way they could do it is high temperature brazing. Ah. And, but even when you did that, unless the person was really, really good at it, it could, it could not, it, you know, it would still leak. And NASA had some very, very sensitive equipment for measuring leakage. And we sent LEM-1 down thinking it was okay at, at Bethpage. And then it got down there, and they used their equipment on it, and it had a hundred leaks. Wow! And, and and it's there was a time when it was pretty sad for Grumman that at that point, you know, that uh, they weren't able to get that. But they overcame it, and eventually they built a a, a spaceship that could really do the job. Beautiful. Okay. Rob, anything to add on to that? I was just going to ask him whether when they changed the two tanks, because you remember that it was symmetrical at yeah. one time, then you had to change it because you realized you couldn't have a dual fuel system. Right. When you changed to the... A little louder, though. Sorry, I don't know if the microphone's working. Oh. Um, when you changed it from a dual fuel system, that you, there was going to be a symmetrical LEM at one point, mm -hmm. and then they simplified it. Did that make that even harder to do that? I... I don't recall that that was the problem. It was made mostly had to do with the uh, term terminals where, right. they, where the piping was turned. Right. You know. I think one, one of the other uh, things, of course, was changing the shape of the pressure vessel when they changed it from a, uh, a spherical shape, which was what they had at the beginning, and went to something that was more like a cylinder. Then they could start dropping out windows because the windows were adding weight. And then when they started dropping out windows, it saved heat buildup inside the LEM as well. So there was less heat because less windows. And that all came with the part you were talking about with getting rid of the seats. They right. didn't, didn't need four windows And anymore. then another weight saver was the, uh, the art of chem milling to get uh, the castings and the sheet metal and so forth. Right. As thin as you could possibly get it, still do the job and so weight savings that way. I mean, it was just one thing after another. It was dying from a thousand cuts, and we had to fix each one of them right, one of the right. times. Yeah. So uh, another thing, uh, 
the, the design today is obvious. You had a motor to take us to the surface and then the upper module that was the return. How did that come about, Bill? Any uh, thing in the history of this that um, were there other choices and and uh, how do we how do we think about that? I think that the the basic sort of two part design where you we have a descent stage and then you use that as your launch platform for for coming up. I, I think that's pretty that comes yeah, that comes that comes pretty early in the in the design. Process. That was early on. They I figured that out. Nineteen forty seven. Wow. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good idea. Uh, what to, to me one of the big challenges of of the program. Uh, was the lack of knowledge about how to design the thing. I mean, we weren't even sure what the lunar surface was like until 1966 when Surveyor 1 lands on, or whichever Surveyor was, in 1966, lands on the surface of the moon. There were, there were actually there were sci reputable scientists who, who, even in 1968, 69, were saying that the surface of the moon has been so pounded by meteorites that it's basically dust. And if you land on it, you're just going to sink in and disappear. Uh, even after Surveyor landed, there was one particular scientist who was continuing to say that you know, the program won't work because of that. So Grumman had a heck of a time because they don't even know until 1966 what the surface is really going to be like. It's a, it's a tough design problem. So and I think there was a, an astronaut review of the design when they first got to interfacing with it where they looked at it thought it was a mock-up because it was so thin and flimsy and they said bring out the real one yeah. is that is that true and and then what and that was the real that one. was the real one <laughs> because we're operating in one six gravity of course and we want to make sure we don't carry any more robustness and, than we need right and that was a challenge for grumman engineering because you've heard the term the grumman ironworks yeah and they're famous for bringing the oh, we're making home. a battleship that's right <laughs> Bring, bringing the pilots back safely in World War II, you know, yeah. they built them like iron. And, uh, I also. think it's, it's useful for the audience to just get a calibration. Most of you are familiar with airplanes where your, um, your fuel might be 20%, uh, 25% of, of your airplane mass. So this vehicle, the, the dry mass of the vehicle is like a quarter of the, of the mm -hmm. wet mass. So three quarters of the weight is all fuel. And um, just generally in space flight, probably that's one of the biggest things that is not immediately obvious. When we fly airplanes, we rely on the, oxi the oxidizers kind of all around it's us. in the air, yeah. You get to carry that with you um, when you go to space, and, and the, the weight of that oxidizer is about eight times the, the weight of the fuel. Yep. And so you're carrying that around with you at the, the entire time, which is why uh, you got to want to minimize, the get the smallest thing back off the surface, right? Right. And in space flight, we kind of work problems backwards. You figure out, well, what's the, what's the smallest piece I can bring the two guys back up in, the, the ascent module? And that size of the descent module that has to bring that down and the fuel required for that, Excellent. and yeah. all the way down the line. So it, it kind of drives the design to this, yeah, this and, configuration. And that was the the one part of of the mission that didn't have duplicity. You had one shot at the engine firing when they were on the moon. You, the explosive bolts had to work. The guillotine had to cut the cable, and the rocket had to fire. If that didn't happen. Yeah, I remember when I joined the, the astronaut program working with John Young, he told a story about that very thing, getting ready to come off the moon, and uh, it was all ones and zeros yeah. in the computer in those days, and the code got sent up, and here's your burn, and, and the, the burn time, and, and his, in his Georgia accent, he said, I'm about to spit blood here. I don't know <laughs> if I get one of these digits wrong, we're not coming off the surface. <laughs> Thanks for the, the little tutorial on, on the mass and the fuel, because that is the, it's kind of the dilemma we have with rockets. You know, the best we can do is about 10% of the mass is not fuel, right, And that, for liftoff. And then, like you say, we get a little better when we're in space. Nowhere near what we can do with an airplane. So yeah. what, what do you think going into the future then, Doug, about all of this? And what's it looking like for... Artemis and the lander and you know so we we basically as I said in the intro we, we plan the Apollo for that that single event kind of really optimize the mission around minimizing the mass coming off and and the big difference going forward is again we want to have a, a long duration presence um, so we really need a system that's more tailored to be refueled in space to, to be reusable reser serviceable and reusable and potentially to be a habitat for a fairly long period which so the great news is a lot of the tough challenges Dick and all these guys worked off about just the, the mechanics of landing, the physics of it. We understand all that. The propulsion is fundamentally the same, yeah. but we are looking at a new, new class of fuels that are you know more storable and can last for a longer period. And again, really driving towards 
fuels that can be generated in situ. Sure. Yeah. So we know now for the first time in human history, we've been able to confirm that there's you know, billions of gallons of water in the form of frozen ice on the south and north pole, deep in craters where it's not been exposed to sunlight. And we're able to take that, uh, that um, water and split it into hydrogen and oxygen and have the ingredients for fuel and oxidizer. So those kind of cons constraints for a more reusable, reserviceable system will drive us to some different optimization. Great, yeah. And the choice of the landing site, by the way, sea of tranquility versus going to the South Pole, how, how did some of that come in, Bill, maybe in the history of, how did we get those choices? Well, of course, the, the whole program is being driven by, we have to get to the moon by the end of the decade, and, and lots of decisions, you know, the, one of the differences now is we're going back sustainably, so we make different you know, engineering choices and design choices. But back then, it was get to the moon by the end of the decade, and, and that drove everything, and then it drives the, the weight questions, drive issues. And so the lunar module was given the minimal capability to get to the moon. I mean, you know, okay, get to the moon. What's the easiest place to land on the moon? On the equator. Ah. Where's, also, where's the flattest place to land on the moon? Most of that stuff is all on the equator, too. So it's the safest spot. It's the easiest place to get to. Um, and and those, those kind of considerations are really what drove, I think, okay. uh, that decision. It was the least, the least fuel. fuel. Least fuel, fuel requirement, yeah. Yeah, yep. okay. Just based on the orbital mechanics of it all, yeah. And so when we go to the, the South Pole, obviously, because of the, the source of water there in the form of ice, there are other benefits, I think, too, to being on the, the South Pole as well, right? From a science research That's and right. astronomy observation, those kinds of things. That's right. Stick so, that um, I, I mean, I, I think it's the, this story of the equatorial landing site on the Pole is really a great one. If anybody's read, like, Jules Verne's early stories about the moon, he kind of predicted a 22 degree latitude location for a launch site because that. That puts you in the plane with the, the lunar ecliptic. Um, so that's the easiest play, place to go to, but it's not the most interesting place. Going to the poles, the North and South Pole, particularly the South Pole, are very interesting spots. One of the reasons being, and, and I think most people may know that on the moon you have a 28-day you know, orbital period. So you've got 14 days of night, 14 days of day. We intend to use solar power for a lot of our systems. On the South Pole, on the rim of a crater, you would have that um, sunlight visible all the time. All the time. Yeah. And that drives a lot of the, again, so because of the resources that are there, the geology, um, and because we have available power, and by, by the same token, we then have line of sight communication to Earth and, and you know, a host of a really great advantages if you can get to that location. But as, as we said, it, it does take a little more it's energy more to get to that location yeah. because it's out of plane with yeah. where we are. Fantastic. So you envision that we, we put a base there to operate from and we could take crew to and from that outpost, if you exactly. will. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And I think, you know, I mentioned this idea of having a, a gateway, an orbiting outpost, which would be in a, a high orbit around the moon. From that particular orbit, it is, it is much less costly in fuel to get to the South Pole. So that's one of the reasons that makes sense versus the direct apology. So we'd have something orbiting continuously from which we would deorbit and return. Yeah. Um, okay. So and that kind of becomes your, your node for aggregating everything you need, fuel and everything at that location. Eventually, you, you can envision. Um, you know, mining that, that water and creating fuel and having that as a fuel depot both to go down and also and to come to back further. up. Yeah, okay. Excellent. How about uh, the voice of God? Chris, are you out there with some questions from the audience for us? Maybe not. <laughs> How much gallons per hour did we burn? Going to the surface, what was the, do you remember, Dick, what the fuel <laughs> load was? Well, Charlie, are you there? Uh, yes, how are you doing, Chris? Okay. Sorry, I was delayed on my God voice here. We, we just got stumped by the audience, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't come in quick enough to save us. <laughs> we had a 1202. 1202. The answer was a lot. A lot, okay, very good. Did you get that in the back? A lot. So I think it's about 15,000 pounds of fuel in 15 minutes, roughly, from when you initiate the, the deorbit so. burn, yeah. okay. roughly. Yeah. Yeah. Thousand pounds a minute. There you go. Fantastic. A lot of juice. Great mind. Fifteen minutes. <laughs> yes. Chris, go for it. Uh, so one of the questions we had is, uh, how tense was it for everybody at Grumman when there were key moments happening on the Apollo 13 uh, mission? Uh, for example, some of those burns. Was that uh, a high up? Was that pretty? Was that a pretty tense moment when these burns, these course correction burns, were happening? Yeah. I, I guess I'll have to paraphrase Tom Kelly's. Uh, he was sitting in a room adjacent to the mission control during uh, the whole the whole mission, and uh, when when it, it, all the, the part that I talked about, when the, the rockets fired and the uh, 
you know, they, they, they separated pe and, and, and got back into lunar orbit. That was, a, that, that was the most tense time they had. Um, I, being a mechanical engineer, I wasn't so much in that end of it, but I can appreciate how that was uh, a very tense time. If it doesn't fire, this whole mission is scrubbed badly. Yeah. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's a famous anecdote about that moment when they got back inside Eagle. Uh, Buzz's backpack broke the engine arm brake yes, off, he did. snapped it right off. And they kind of looked at what we're going to do about this, and they jammed a Fisher space pen into the brake to yeah. on the engine. <laughs> that was a stressful moment. That's yeah, not Hollywood. Hollywood. <laughs> that wasn't Hollywood. <laughs> Chris, could I, could I, um, yes, go for it. Respond to that fuel question is a really interesting one. You, yeah. you kind of alluded to it, Charlie. So if you think about this little tiny thing, weighs about um, maybe 10,000 pounds or so, the, the sense stage, is what we have to get back off the surface. And then, you, as I said, you work it backwards. How much fuel do I need in the, the descent to get it down? How much do I need in the service module to get it back to Earth? And how much do I need to get that out of Earth orbit? You end up with this stack, yeah. working that problem backwards. Right, right. From the 10,000 pound vehicle, you end up with a about a seven million, seven pound, million vehicle pound vehicle on the pad. That's right. And to put that in perspective, as you said, 95% of that's just fuel. fuel. That's right. right. And this is such a demanding mission that when we get to the surface with this thing, we have 15 seconds left. Yep. No joke. Right. So that kind of tells you what kind of margins you're working with from about seven million pounds of fuel to 15 seconds 15 left. Seconds. Uh, again, just shows you how important it is to have a heavy lift capability because yeah. getting out of this gravity well is really challenging. Mm -hmm. Chris, you got one more and then we'll go to a couple of neat videos here. I do. The uh, lunar module underwent several changes. Is there a version of the lunar module that you favor or think would have been a better version? No, it's not a beautiful vehicle, <laughs> but, it's, but it's very functional. And when all things were analyzed, we got what we ended up with, and it did perform as advertised. And, so uh, I, I wonder if I could just real yeah. quickly. This is a really important comment that, that Dick made. It's not a beautiful vehicle. I, I just, I'm kind of uh, very interested in aesthetics of aviation, and most of us can tell that airplane looks aerodynamic, right. looks right. slick, right? We kind of have an intuition for that because of animals, birds flying, and we're, we're part of this environment. Everything about space is completely foreign to our intuition. Yes. So reverse. the engineering dictates a vehicle that looks nothing right. like what human intuition would. And, and the flight characteristics, you probably could tell yep. us a little more of that. You know, in 1.6G, right? So when we bank an airplane, we expect things to happen. If I bank 30 degrees, I get half, exactly. half a G load. That does not happen with the lunar module because your inertia is the same, the mass of the vehicle, but the, the, the weight's only 1.6. So you can develop a lot of bank and not get going very fast. And exactly. it, it changes everything. Neil had to learn how to fly that on, on the, the, the practice base. Had to eject out of one, as a matter of yeah. fact. <laughs> no, that's an excellent comment because I often get asked, aren't we going backwards to leave the winged vehicle of the space shuttle orbiter and go back to capsules? Well, matter of fact, it doesn't, you know, we all have this intuition about beautiful airplanes fly beautifully, but when you think of the mission, when we're going to a place that doesn't have an atmosphere, carrying a wing doesn't make a lot of sense, right? So. <laughs> All of these things, the way that looks, is really designed for the environment it has to work in. One comment I want to say is that the Grumman engineers went from that to the F-14. They yeah. wanted to get even with a beautiful <laughs> airplane. That's a beautiful airplane. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, look, um, we've got a, a couple of really great videos to finish this segment on, but I want to uh, thank the panelists uh, before we get into these. Uh, how about a round of applause for our great panel? So, um, Rob is our historian, has been involved in some of the, rec you know, the uh, rejuvenation of a lot of the, the uh, film and uh, audio that has come out of the Apollo archives. Um, I want to finish the segment on a couple of those. One, the second one hasn't been shown publicly yet, and he's going to stay and narrate it for us. But the first one is uh, is very dynamic because it has both the control center and the lander views with Neil and Buzz as they're going to the surface. And uh, it starts out with a go-no-go no go call from uh, Gene Kranz in the control center. So would you roll that for us? Everything looking good. 
Altitude 5200 feet. Controllers, gonna go for landing. Retro. Go. Fido. Go. Guide. Go. Control. Go. Down. Go. 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 Econ. Surgeon. Go. Capcom, we're go for landing. Altitude 4200. Houston, you're go for landing. Over. I do understand. Go for landing. 3,000 feet. Shot alarm. 1201. 1201. Roger, 1201. Same type, we're go flight. Okay, we're go. We're go, same type, we're go. Flight side or right on real good, Roger. 2000 feet, 2000 feet, into the ag, 47 degrees. Roger. 37 degrees. Roger, looking about. He looks okay. We've okay. got four and a half. Roger. Eagle looking great, you're go. Altitude update, Neil. Altitude 16. Roger. 1400 feet, still looking very good. Roger, 1202, we copy it. How you doing, Control? We look good here, fine. All right, how about you, Tom? Go, guys, you have me? Go, Fido, go. 700 feet, 21 down, 33 degrees. 100 feet down at 19. 540 feet down at 30, and at 15. Attitude home? Okay, at hold. I think we better be quiet, fine. Right. Okay, the only call outs from now on will be fuel. Okay, forward. 150 feet down at 4. P66. 30 split to half down. Your uh, egg gun nut, horizontal velocity. Standard feet down 3.5. 47 forward. What up? On 1 a minute. 1.5 down. 70. Epic shadow up there. 50 down at 2.5. 19 forward. Okay, Bob, I'll be standing by for your call out shortly. 3.5 down. 220 feet. 13 forward. 11 forward. Come down nicely. 200 feet. 4.5 down. Five and a half down. Six, 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 six and a half down. Five and a half down. Nine forward. Low level? Low level. Good. And twenty feet. Hundred feet, three and a half down. Nine forward. Five percent. Hundred and five. Eight seventy five feet. Right, looking good, down a half. Roger. Six, four. 60. 60 seconds. 60 seconds. Lights on. Six. Down two and a half. Forward. Forward. That's 40 feet down two and a half. Picking up some dust. 30 feet two and a half down. Straight shadow. Stand by for 30. Four forward. Four forward, drift into the right a little. Thirty. Six, Thirty six, seconds. And a half. Thirty seconds. Forward, just. Good. Okay. On back light. Okay, engine stop. APA at a descent. Hold control, both auto, descent engine command override off. Engine arm off. Port 13 is in. We had shut down. We copy you down, Eagle. Okay, everybody, T1, stand by, T1. Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. Roger, Tranquility, we copy you on the ground. You got a bunch of guys back in the front blue, we're bringing again, thanks a lot. Thank you, Eagle, 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 Eagle. you're looking good here. Okay, we're going to be busy for a minute. Okay, we're going to be a minute. Thank you. We can go ahead and cut that off there. Thank you very much. So 250,000 miles and you touch down with 15 seconds of fuel left. That's quite the deal. So um, what a night that was for all of us to, that we got to watch that. And uh, what got recorded in the archives, turns out many of the films actually got put away and not looked at. Right, Rob? Correct, yes. So you're going to show something that nobody's seen here with uh, what you've recreated. Sure. You wanna, let's like let's run that. Yeah. 
So uh, what happened was a little while back, NASA sent me the negative of the film that was shot on the surface of the moon, 16 millimeter. The camera was in the window of the LEM, and it had been left running at one frame per second. Uh, but when that film was processed and used over the last 50 years, it was very dark. And so if you look at the image you're seeing right now, this is from 1970, and the shadows, is particularly in the bottom left-hand corner, are pitch black. And the next clip, this is from the transfer that was done in 1999 that I requested. And that little white diamond in the bottom left-hand corner is actually Neil's helmet. And he's just completely invisible there. So in 2005, I asked for a high definition transfer to be done, and this is what you're seeing now. It's running a little bit fast, 24 frames a second, but essentially everything in that bottom corner is invisible. Uh, but on the internegative that was recorded and actually sealed in a can 50 years ago today, that was going on in the corner. And uh, I just happened to spot that about a month ago. And so we decided to do our best to try and restore it and bring it out. So what you're seeing here has never actually been seen before. This is the same moment from the current high definition transfer, which has just been doing the theaters recently. And here's after it has been restored from the internegative. And we'll run the short three minute clip of that. And what you're actually seeing now is the moment where Buzz had the Hasselblad still camera on his chest, and he brings it back to Neil. Neil's now coming into the frame. And that sort of yellow tinge to the suit is the reflection off the mylar on the lamp. And Buzz is just off frame at the bottom right now. So you're about to see the creation of a very famous photograph here that has not been seen. If you look very closely, you can actually see Buzz, this sort of a black line moving across Neil's visor. And the color is actually good enough that you can see the stars and stripes on the backpacks and their arms. Now here's Buzz coming in, handing Neil the still camera, which is a moment that nobody quite knew exactly when that happened, but this is it. And uh, Neil then takes it, bolts it back to the bracket on his chest. Buzz goes off and uh, reports his suit system readings back to Mission Control. And in a second, Neil will do the same. Neil's now prepping the camera, presumably changing the f-stop, the focus, making sure it's wound on. Here comes Buzz. Moving off to the right, and you'll see Buzz's shadow stop moving. He's posing for a picture. <laughs> so Neil now takes Buzz's first picture. Roger, and Neil has uh, 66 percent, O2, no flags, minimum cooling, and the suit pressure is 382. And you can see Buzz has stopped moving now. Neil just took that picture. And then Neil steps out of the shadows. Which has been seen before. Neil has and then leans in to take this collecting picture. Collecting and packing the bulk sample. There it is. Great photo. That's some great sleuthing work there to give us something we've never seen just before. Just luck. I just <laughs> happened to be looking at the monitor at the One right One more moment. round of applause for our panelists here. Thank you. Okay, we're going to take a couple of minute intermission here to reset the stage for Joe and Mike. Be right back, everybody. Thank you.
Uh, okay, folks, if we could take our seats again, we'll get the next show part of the show started. Welcome back. Thank you. All righty. Let's start some big fun here. We got uh, a couple of very special guests. And I'm going to invite Joe Engel and Mike Collins to the stage. So I'll bring out Joe Engel first. Joe Henry, would you join me on the stage? Thank you, Joe. Mike is talking. <laughs> so, a little bit about Joe that you might not know. Uh, Joe Henry Engel flew F 100s uh, in the Air Force and then went to the test pilot school. And, uh, and we'll learn a little bit more about that in a bit here when Mike comes out because they got to fly together. Uh, but of course, Joe went on in 1965, flew the X 15. Uh, to an altitude of over 280,000 feet, and then uh, three of his 16 flights went over 264,000 feet, hitting the 50-mile mark for uh, qualifying as astronaut before he ever went to, to NASA. Um, he was uh, also one of 19 pilots selected for space missions, backup of Apollo 14 and Apollo 10, and we'll get to hear a lot more about that. Uh, and then he flew uh, as the only guy to have flown manually all the way down from reentry in the space shuttle. So, Joe, thanks for being here with us Thank tonight. Thank you, Tony. I want to see where he sits down. I'm not going anywhere. Yeah, I'm, I'm sitting on his lap. Yeah. Thank, yeah. Thank you. Joe, go ahead and grab a seat there if you would. Okay. Be comfortable. And next, I'd like to invite Mike Collins to the stage. Right over here, Mike. Right over here. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, sir. Oh, oh, so go. <laughs> Sit. <laughs> Sit. <laughs> A man who needs yeah. little introduction, now, but, now uh, stay, stay. you know, there's uh, a few things I'd like to say about Mike as we get started here. Uh, Mike, of course, uh, joined the program and, and flew in the Gemini program on Gemini 10, a pilot of a three-day mission. Uh, also did some of the very early rendezvous and docking missions that I'm sure we'll hear a little bit about. And he was the command pilot on Apollo 11 for the Columbia. And uh, we're going to hear a lot about that, too. Mike went on to write a book, Carrying the Fire, and he also served as the director of the National Air and Space Museum uh, after he left NASA. So, Mike, thank you for being here tonight. Well, tonight, um, you know, it's all about Apollo 11, of course, and just thank you both for being here to celebrate with the uh, the crowd. This is a special crowd. They're lovers of aviation. They have a passion for aviation like we do. Um, and a lot of the astronauts have had an affinity for EAA, and both of you have. Can you talk a little bit about previous connections with Oshkosh and EAA? Joe, you've been here several times. Well, Charlie, you bet. I'll be glad to. Uh, I first started really getting an interest in EAA because of what it said, experimental aircraft. and. Um, when I was first learning to fly, uh, the, my instructor, who was a wonderful guy, uh, Henry Dittmer, uh, he, I was working in summers uh, down at Cessna Aircraft Company in Wichita ah. in order to go back to school, to save money to go back to school. Really wanted to fly desperately. And Henry, uh, he, was a flight, he was a CFI. He was an instructor. Knew I wanted to learn to fly. Knew I saw that I really did love airplanes. Offered to teach me to fly. Uh, and he got me my first job at a little grass strip, Rodden Airport, a little grass strip there at, right off the end of the Cessna runway. And for eight hours of uh, sweeping hangers and cleaning toilets and stuff that you do it, <laughs> to anything, you know, we'll fly for anything. Uh, for eight hours of work, I would get one hour in the Cessna 120 that sat outside. Nice. And uh, 
That's how I got started flying, and, and then Henry saw that I really was serious about it, so he said, okay, next summer when you come back between semester, between school years, uh, we're going to build an airplane. So wow. he bought a Stitz Flutterbug. Uh, anybody remember what a Stitz Flutterbug, the early ones, the single seat? I hear a few plazas out there. A few plazas, but this was before most people <laughs> out here were born, I think. <laughs> It was a little ugly little airplane. That probably the most, probably the ugliest airplane I think I've ever seen. <laughs> a lot more have seen the airplane. They know about the stits. It had a tricycle gear, which which made it a modern airplane at that time. This was back in the early 50s, and uh, I, I can remember going to buy parts for it. The the wheels, the tricycle gear, all three wheels were wheelbarrow wheels. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, they were, they were serious. And, uh, You're off to a good start there, Joe. So we went to the hardware store. <laughs> well, it took off, I think, at 40 miles an hour and landed at 40 miles an hour, and top speed was about 43 miles an hour. So. <laughs> but but we went to the hardware store to get the wheels, and uh, Henry would pick them up and slide them on this axle and s spin them up to see if there was any balance, how they balanced out. And so we'd pick out three good wheels, and the store owner came up and he said, what? What are you doing? And, and Henry said, we're just making sure that it doesn't shimmy and walk. He said, well, you're, you're not gonna, this is a wheelbarrow. You're not going to be calling big loads that fast. And uh, he said, well, we're not really going to put them on a wheelbarrow. And he said, what are you going to do? I think we'll put them on an airplane. And the guy looked at him with this, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> but, but the fact that I you're was able to You're one of the original help, EAA guys, I think. You, What's that? You were one of the original EAA guys, I think, by the sounds of it. Well, I don't, I don't know, but I was sure, <laughs> I was sure proud of, of flying an experimental airplane. I tell That's you. fantastic. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Let's hear it for that. A home builder. <laughs> and Mike, I was reading in your book, you had a little bit of an affinity too. You built a model of a BG, I guess, right? A GB. The GB model, the GB aircraft. Who, me? Mike, Mike did, you right? You mean Mike. Did you build a GB? Gigantic fuselage and tiny little wings. Yeah. Uh, it was not unlike the F-104, which is one of my, uh, <laughs> <laughs> one of my favorite planes. So. You know, we had the GB out here, uh, oh, probably 10 years ago now, and it was flown right here at the show, so there's a connection there. I bet it looked like it was falling out of the sky. Pretty much. It didn't, it didn't look right, but it was, for a model maker, it was a dream. So how did you get your start in flying then, Mike? My dad took me uh, up in an airplane. He was not a pilot, but he uh, had access to, a, uh, to, to uh, one of the early uh, Navy amphibians, and he took me up, and the uh, pilot showed me everything I needed to know which was how you keep that little thing on the horizon, and that was way beyond my capability. I mean, it just got worse and worse and worse as the lesson went by, and finally the poor pilot had to grab it away from me. But then you guys got to fly together, right? Joe, didn't you fly with Mike when you went to Edwards? We did. Um, when I got I was selected for the test pilot school, and and finished the school. The dream of everybody that wants to be a test pilot is to go to fighter test operations at, at Edwards. And uh, I remember I graduated and I got that assignment. I was thrilled to death and I went down and kind of checked in and Mike was already there. He was an old guy. He was, he was one of the old heads. He was the old guy? He's, he was the old head. An experienced old head. You're about to slap him, right? <laughs> well, I used to fly with him, but I didn't, in a dual control, I didn't particularly like it. He, <laughs> well, uh, we, we, I knew there would be a discrepancy yeah, in the story. He, no, uh, but you, you, believe me, you can believe me. Okay, you keep going yeah, then. Kind of, <laughs> if you just laugh at Mike, he's happy. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to say he hogged the controls, that's unfair, but you could feel a delicate presence there that was not your own. <laughs> <laughs> well, when, when I first got down to test We might never get to the part where you actually did something in this flight. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think we ever did anything, really. We just flew. We had fun flying together. 
But my first flight at test ops was an area orientation, you know, where you take the new guy out and you, you say, okay, here's, a, here's the end of our, our area. This is our restricted area. You got to stay inside here. If you're carrying ordnance, you can't go here and there. That kind of thing. And here, these are the dry lake beds. And always remember which way it is back home. And um, Mike, I remember I was scheduled. Mike was going to give me my area orientation in an F 104D the two-seater. And uh, you stop shaking your head because you don't know what's coming up. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> so... I was pretending I couldn't hear you. And I didn't. <laughs> I believe everything but the pretend on that one. <laughs> and... <laughs> and, and so I was, I was really scared because I, I didn't know Mike then. And, and he was just as ferocious looking then as he is now. <laughs> and so I, I wanted to be ready for this flight and make a good impression so that Mike would come back and tell all the big guys in flight test, Engel's okay, you can let him go fly. So, uh, man, I studied up on the area. I didn't want to get lost or anything up there if I, if I did get to touch a stick. And... Uh, uh, so we were ready to go out. I, I had maps made up, and I had a knee board that I had, had a special clip on it that I could go back and forth to get different areas on. I thought, I think I'm ready. So we walked out to the airplane, and I got in, and it took Mike no time at all. Of course, as soon as we got in, he was ready to crank, and I was still fumbling to try to figure out where the seat belt was. And <laughs> we took off, and I thought, well, now, now I can kind of look around and listen carefully to Mike. And he said, you want to fly, Joe Henry? And I said, sure. You know, and I, I didn't want to turn down the flight time. So I, I, I was getting my step out of the way so the stick wouldn't get in the way. And this knee board that I had taken the maps, I, I pushed it over and I, it wouldn't go anywhere good. So I unstrapped it and laid it on the side console so that I could make an impression on this old <laughs> head who, who was giving me my checkout. And I... Uh, I didn't notice it, but the bottom of the clipboard was a little bit different than what I was used to, and I had to kind of shove it to get it to stay over there on the side console. Well, the jettison buttons for the tip tanks were over there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I was trying to position that damn knee board, and, one, and the left tip tank blew off. And we had just crossed over. That. You're going to have to repeat that one. That, that was worth repeating. <laughs> well, you'll see in this interview, Mike is, Mike is a real, real he, he loves a good joke, and, he liked, and he's a real straight-ace guy. I mean, he, didn't, he can't get fooled you with where his attention is. In fact, I have no idea what he's thinking about now. But, <laughs> but, but the tank blew off, and Mike didn't say anything. And I thought, God, I wonder... I wonder if I could get away with it. I wonder, if, <laughs> I wonder if I could blow the other... Should I blow the other tank off so maybe he'll notice it? I mean, anybody could notice a 104 with one tip tank on it, but if it's got two tip tanks, you know, how do you know? <laughs> and so I said, um, Hey, Mike, did you hear that thump? <laughs> and Mike is up there saying, you know, he just turned the airplane over to me, so... He's probably already asleep. He didn't. He said, "What thump?" And I said, "Well, I think I may have just blown a tip tank off." And uh, he said, "Oh, really? Well, seems to be flying okay. Let's press on with the checkout." And, <laughs> and boy, bless his heart. That's why. That's why Mike is such a good friend of mine. I, I'm still trying to be his friend, but that's why he's a good friend of mine. <laughs> is because, you know, he he covered for me. I don't, know what you, I don't know what you told the guys back at Ops. I don't know. It sounds like the flight from hell. <laughs> I mean, uh, I, uh, uh, you know, I just, I was innocent. I thought you had a bottle underneath the kneeboard. <laughs> and I, I, the rest of the story, I, you kind of lost me there. <laughs> I was wondering. So did he get a call sign for that? You know, when you make a mistake like that, you usually get a call sign. Oh, we had a guy in Germany I was flying with. He jettisoned the tank. He's been called Tank ever since. So <laughs> did you guys give Joe a call sign for that? I don't think so. No? No, I think Mike was really great. That's why, that's why I like him so much. He covered for me that day. Yeah. <laughs>
I don't know how he did it. But. So I also heard a story, Mike. I, you'll have to verify that this one might be true as well. Something about 2.75 rockets and going out to create a tank killer, oh, Joe. Oh, and the mad frag. You guys were going to... Parachute bomb. Or yeah, I remember parachute bombs. It's, 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 it's a pretty big thing. It's more than two inches, and I, I think it's a little less than three inches. I don't know. I got one too clear on that, but uh, <laughs> it was, uh, yeah. How did, there was something, how did we get to be talking about that? Did I fire one by mistake? Did I, what did I do that? <laughs> <laughs> no, but there was I, something about you thought he couldn't hit the broad side of a barn, so you were going to sit in the tank and let him try to shoot you. I think. Oh, he wasn't going <laughs> to sit in the tank. No. It's, no? This, this, was a, this was a new weapon cluster that, that at Edwards you got a lot of these things that would come in from the field and say, run separation tests on them, make, it clear, make sure they clear the airplane. And that was what we were going to be doing with it. But they were those little canisters about like a Coke, a Coke can, about the size of a Coke can. And they had a little parachute on them that when you deployed them, they'd slide out of this tube and the parachute would open. And it had a, a shaped charge on the inside, which when they, when they impacted, it, it would trigger the charge. And it, it, it focused the, the pressure wave so that it would blow a little tiny hole in a tank. And if they wanted to, Edwards got the assignment to see, make sure it would, Deploy from an F-100, okay. And Mike and I were—I don't know what we were doing, playing, playing AC Deuce or something. And and, and um, Mike went to the to the uh, military academy, the West Point. So he's a West Point graduate, the long thin line. And uh, and he said, you know, I drove a tank at summer camp one day or during summer between years. I drove a tank. I can drive a tank. And, and so we, we cocked up this chess program where Mike would, we were going to borrow a tank from Fort Irwin and, and have it trucked over to Edwards. And then we were going to have maintenance, or have ordnance guys put little white phosphorus charges in these bombs instead of the shape charge. And <clears throat> we figured Mike could take the tank out to the gunnery range and, and I would take off with the 100 and find him out there and I would make a pass and we had a bet that I don't forget what we bet probably I don't know but bet that I, I bet I, I could hit you with this thing I could hit you with this cluster of tanks with this cluster of bombs parachutes would fall down and just blanket an area and Mike was convinced that I could never catch him in a tank because he knew how to drive a tank he'd been to West Point <laughs> hell who would, if you've been to West Point surely you can dodge these little parachutes coming down we had a great little program planned out, and the guys, uh, you know, the other pilots, were, they loved the idea, but we couldn't sell it to the guys on up the stairs. So we never got to do that program. But. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you don't believe the story, then was it good? Did you like it anyway? <laughs> I, I think I, I missed parts of it. Um, there was no sex in it. <laughs> Uh, not not but, in this one, no. But, you know, other than that, I, I guess it was kind of okay. <laughs> I'm uh, done. The rest of them go to him. The rest of them go to him. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, Mike, what coming out of Edwards then, what was the path for you into the astronaut program? How did that work? I'm sorry, what was What the was your pathway from Edwards into the astronaut program? Oh, uh... I, I don't know. I, I think, uh, uh, you know, going through Edwards was a good preparation. Uh, I, for example, they recently picked uh, 12 uh, astronaut candidates and they had over 18,000 uh, applicants. You know, with that kind of arithmetic, no way in hell I'd end up uh, in, as, as an astronaut. But uh, uh, I, I think that uh, the, the program's in good shape uh, the, the, and it's well... Uh, well staffed and they know where they're going and need a little money to get there and off we go again. <laughs> so what did you, what were your first assignments then when you showed up at uh, NASA? Oh, when I first showed up in uh, N NASA, I don't remember what the hell I did. I sort of fiddled with paperwork <laughs> for a long, long time and, uh, and, and then eventually I got assigned to a, oh, a backup crew uh, on Gemini. Uh, I was on a backup crew with a guy named Ed White, 
who unfortunately was killed in a fire aboard Apollo 1, but Ed was a classmate of mine from West Point. He was a fantastic guy. He was a, uh, a intercollegiate, uh, part of an, uh, of an intercollegiate track team uh, that, that won the East Coast uh, that uh, honors that where he was a terrific athlete and just a wonderful guy. And uh, he sort of led me around. And uh, so I went from a backup crew to, uh, to a crew with John Young. Uh, John Young and I were, uh, uh, he was, John Young, was, I, I think, was probably of his time the most successful of astronauts. He flew a couple of, uh, a couple of Geminis, a couple of Apollos, a couple of shuttles. Right. He was head of the, uh, of the astronaut office. Uh, I, I remember well, uh, we had a press conference, and for some reason the, the press got uh, talking about crew compatibility, they considered that to be uh, very important, and I guess it is, especially if you're going to go to Mars or someplace, very important, but uh, um, they asked me about how I felt about that, and I looked at John and said, well, look, I want to fly in uh, space so bad, badly, uh, I'd fly with a baboon. and. Uh, <laughs> And, and John understood, you know, instead of taking umbrage with that, he understood uh, exactly what I meant, and we were good friends before and after that. <laughs> he was quite the guy. So you did the, uh, the first rendezvous and, and docking maneuvers then to demonstrate the capability. Um, how did that come about? Well, the, the thing we were most worried about in, in the moon uh, uh, sequence of events was the uh, rendezvous and docking. Uh, and we had Buzz Aldrin, oh, he was, uh, Buzz Aldrin had graduated number two in his class at West Point. He'd gone on to uh, MIT, which is, you know, not too shabby. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, he not only had a PhD from MIT, but his uh, doctoral dissertation was in rendezvous and docking. And that was exactly what, uh, we were looking for in NASA at that time, so we welcomed Buzz at, uh, with open arms. Now, when we went to cocktail parties, you try not to sit next to Buzz, <laughs> because Buzz would say, well, the paraloon and the apogee has got a renaminous ascension of 0 0.05 between here and there, and, uh, you know, it, it wore a little bit, but uh, God, he was... Uh, he was a terrific uh, crewmate, but where was I? So anyway, I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I got into that program, and I was assigned with John Young to uh, Gemini 10, which was a nice little flight, a nice little two-seater, two it was a nice little <laughs> flying machine. Um, and uh, uh, we set an, a world altitude record, and I did a couple of spacewalks, which were interesting. And um, it was nice. It was a good little program. I like <laughs> Gemini. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Uh, well, thank, you. Yeah. thank you. So, Joe, meanwhile, you're still at Edwards, I think for part of this flying uh, X-15s, right? I'm still trying to figure out what my excuse was for blowing that tank off of the new <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, Mike and I went to the Aerospace Research Pilot School together in the same class. Yeah. And um, when we finished school, it was about the time that NASA was, had announced they were gonna select another group, I believe. The timing was about, about there. And, um, uh, General Branch, General Trigg Branch, who was the commander at Edwards, was a great, great guy. He had called, he called me, I got word through the test ops commander that he, General Branch wanted to see you. Normally when General Branch wants to see you, you've done something that you wish you probably would like to rethink about and <laughs> not do it again. So but he was a good guy. Say that again? Branch, General Branch at Edwards. Oh. Yeah. And he, he had called me into his office, so I went in and, and um, I reported in like you, you're supposed to, I thought. And uh, he said, sit down, Engel. And so I, yes, sir. And um, he said, I see your application here for uh, NASA, the NASA program. 
the next group of astronauts. And I said, well, yes, sir. Because everybody in our class was, about everybody applied that, that year in our class. And I, you know, I didn't want to get left behind, so I filled out the application. <laughs> and it was laying there on his desk. And he picked it up and he looked at it. He says, well, I, I don't think I'm going to approve this one. So he just <laughs> tore it apart and threw it back down. <laughs> And I stood there kind of with my mouth open, I guess. He said, that's all. I said, yes, sir. And I turned around and came. I didn't know why, but found out later that he wasn't, he wasn't going to approve my application because he had earmarked to fly the X-15 to take uh, Bob White's place on the X-15 ah, team. Yeah. Bob was going to go to Germany for, to take over a wing. So I didn't know that at the time. And I just thought, well, I just didn't qualify. I wasn't, I wasn't even in the running. So... I, I was happy. I went back to test ops, and we had 104s to fly, 105s, 10. We had a bunch of different, a whole ramp full of airplanes. And at that time, the the philosophy in the Air Force, at least in the flight test community, was to encourage the pilots to fly as many different kinds of airplanes as you could, so that when you got a new airplane as a project, you'd have a good yardstick to measure it with, which made sense. And of course, to all the pilots. All the young buck pilots like Mike and I, we, we loved that idea of flying, flying everything you can get your hand on. Shoot, Navy airplanes would come in there for spend the weekend and you'd go down to the flight line and try and talk the crew chief into letting you fly it around a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Worked out okay. So the X-15, when you were flying the X-15, Joe, uh, Neil had been working uh, ahead of you on the X-15 program. That's right. Neil Armstrong. And... Uh, uh, he, he was more uh, in his flights chasing the speed records, and you were going after the altitude. Is that right? Um, we had two basic profiles with the X-15. Was was the, the low altitude speed or heating profile to study the, the heating characteristics at, at hypersonic speeds, yeah. and uh, and the, how the shock waves affected the response responsiveness of the airplane, the stability of the airplane, uh, and then the other. The other goal of the X-15 program was to develop a control system and a technique to fly back in from space with a winged vehicle and recover it on the dry lake bed or recover it on a runway. So, yeah, you, and they, they tended to kind of compartment you a little bit just for familiarity with the profile so that you were more easily recognized when you were drifting off or when something abnormal was happening. And talk a little bit about Neil's flight where he got lofted and, and had trouble getting back to the lake bed. Neil, Neil was kind of the new guy, new NASA guy on the X-15 team, new pilot guy. And uh, he had a project called the G-Limiter uh, on the X-15 where Minneapolis Honeywell was attempting to put in uh, a sit into the flight control system a device, a mechanical device that would limit you as to how many G's you could pull. You could set this little deal and set the counterbalance back and forth, and it would limit how many G's you could pull with the airplane. Uh, the idea being when we did get up to the higher, higher altitudes, you could overstress the airplane re-entering by pulling past, well, past five and a half G's after giving it, subjecting it to the thermal temperatures mm. of getting out through the atmosphere. So. Neil, was, Neil had set that flight for, uh, I, I believe it was four Gs, three and a half or four Gs, as, as a progression to, to checking it out. And he had gone to not a really extremely high altitude, I can't remember the altitude, 220 or 230,000, and he was re-entering and was pulling back and brought the G level up to the limit, about the limit, and he was trying to see if he could, if when he put more stick in, if it would pull more G's, or if the G limiter was going to hold him, keep him from doing it. And he, were, he got so focused on, on trying to see whether the G limiter was active or not, that he uh, held, held three and a half or four G's until he stopped his descent, and then he held the G's and it started lofting him back up again. And by the time he saw that he was heading back uphill, uh, he was already getting out of the dense atmosphere, couldn't get a bite into the atmosphere to pull back in and uh, you know, lofted out over, over Burbank. He ended up over Burbank. And, and stre he stretched it back in. I, I got to tell you, boy, he went right to the max L over D angle of attack, blew everything off that he didn't need and uh, glided in. But instead of hitting overhead key, at, heading north to south at oh, 35, 40,000 feet, 
he came in from the south, didn't have it over yet, he came straight in and uh, kind of knocked a few cactus trees out of the way and, <laughs> and landed on the south end of the road. But he got it back, he got the airplane back. It's outstanding. So then you're uh, checking in at NASA, and I guess uh, we all have heard, and I had my own experience with uh, medical tests and all that. What was, uh, was there any truth to what we see in some of the movies about the rigor of the medical tests as you enter into the program, Mike? Um, we had a guy, for instance, um, who was uh, part of the surgeons that would check us out, and his name was Dr. Hind. So you can imagine what his role was. Um, <laughs> did you? Was he there when when you guys were there? No. no. I, I, I thought I thought most of it was uh, quite legitimate and, and probably uh, rigorous. The uh, the tests I remember in particular, they assigned two flight surgeons to my uh, body, and uh, one looked in the uh, left ear, one looked in the right ear. They didn't. They didn't see each other. I was in. Now, 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 however, the previous year I had flunked, and uh, I think I did okay on you know that that very sensible test where they pour cold water into one ear. You remember that? One? Anyway, uh, this one was. Uh, the psychiatric test, and it was a whole series of Rorschach uh, ink blots. And I was aces at that. Oh, that looks like a, um, I'm not allowed to say that. But, uh, but then the last one was a blank piece of paper, eight by 10 or 10 by 14, a huge piece of white, empty paper. And I had to say what I saw, and I said, well, of course, it's a little, 11 f polar bears fornicating in a snowbank. And, uh, and I. 11? Well, no. I, you know, I. I, I thought that was, uh, I thought that was mildly amusing, but I could see, I could see the interrogator scowl. And I, I flunked. And then the next year, I flunked the NASA application. Next year I came back and I saw my mother and my father and my father was a little bit taller than my mother and lo and behold I passed. So, that's my story. Trainable, yeah. right? What, one thing, you saw 11 polar bears fornicating? <laughs> Joe, you don't want to sweat the details. <laughs> 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 okay. Uh, <laughs> thanks for sharing that. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm not sure I transition to the next one after that. <laughs> Say what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to figure out a transition after that. <laughs> so, a little bit about family life because. Um, the program was Fast and Furious, and you guys are doing all kinds of stuff, traveling, experimenting, and flying stuff for the first time. What was, uh, what was life generally like as you're moving through the program? It, it was demanding. There, there, there's just no question. It was demanding on your family life and uh, uh, your relationship with your kids as they were growing up. You, you, Everybody, everybody has that problem. They wish they could spend more time at home. Yeah. Jobs are demanding, but not just astronaut jobs, but or not just being an astronaut, but every job is demanding. So you have to you have to make those decisions. And, and so, um, in the background, of course, the Apollo program was all about beating the Russians to the moon and uh, amazing speed uh, that we went through this program. Was that pressure there for schedule and? and meeting schedules through the program? Did you feel pressure from the schedule because of the, the mandate to, to meet by the end of the decade? Well, I, I felt a lot of pressure. Uh, every time I was on a crew assignment, I, I felt pressure. Uh, uh, and of course, we understood that the, uh, the Soviets were coming along nicely with their program. It was They were not Johnny-come-latelys. If you go back and check the history books, you look at Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, uh, and he was right up there on a par with Robert Goddard or any of our experts. So 
the Soviets were to be respected, and we did respect them, but in our day-to-day -day, uh, labors, uh, I at least uh, didn't pay a hell of a lot of attention to them. Uh, uh, I knew they were there, we knew they were there, and that they had the, uh, the possibility of, of perhaps beating us to the moon. We didn't think so, but we had enough on our plate without worrying about the, uh, the Russians or the Soviets. So, so if, I, if, if I take uh, what happened uh, from Apollo 1 through Apollo 11, um, the dates are just mind-boggling to me. So the Apollo 1 fire was in January of 1967. Apollo 8 is December of 1968 and the landing on the moon is July of 1969. So that, to me, is a big wow. I mean, to get all that way in that short period of time. Um, and the obvious question for us today, and we're trying to get back to the moon and go on to Mars, is how do we move faster? Um, there, there were leaders then at NASA, George Lowe and others, that made this happen. Any, any thoughts about, what are your memories about the leadership at NASA and how they made this happen? Uh, Chris Kraft, George Lowe, um, who were the... Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, well, George Lowe was, um, I, I don't want to say a youngster, because they were all pretty young in those days, but he was not uh, one of the most senior guys on the planning staff, and uh, yet he was the one who, uh, who convinced uh, NASA administration to... Uh, to uh, instead of having Apollo uh, 8 uh, be sort of a, a, a gussied up of, of Apollo 7, instead of that, he decided to send Apollo 8 all the way to the moon, which was a, at the time a very risky and a very gutsy uh, decision. Turned out to be a, a very, uh, a very good one. It accelerated our pace considerably. Did I, but I'm not sure I missed you. I think I missed your, the thrust of your question. I'm just wondering how you uh, credit the choices they made in, in how fast they were able to move. Um, what we see today sometimes is not. Yeah, I, I, I think uh, throughout, uh, Bob Gilruth was the center director uh, in Houston, and uh, he, he was a, not an impressive looking guy. But the more you uh, spent time with him, the more impressive he was in his ability to make uh, engineering and personnel judgments. And uh, he, more than any uh, one person, I would say, uh, uh, kind of set the pace. And, uh, and and it was a good pace. It was it was we were swift. We were we were. As I say, I always felt the pressure to get this done, get it done well, but also get it done now, um, all the way up through the launch of 11. Yeah, and one other thing, Charlie, I think that I, I was uh, kind of sitting there with, in, in the days at, at the way that the mission, mission objectives were changed and switched around uh -huh. at relatively the last minute in order to still beat the Russians to a particular thing. In other words, to get to fly around the moon. I think Apollo 8 originally was not scheduled to go to the moon until until they heard that the Russians were very shortly going to launch an a orbiter. Yeah. yeah. So then the mission started shuffling. And these poor guys that were assigned to the missions, you know, they had to pick up a different mission book with rules and, 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 everything, and learn different things, learn yeah. different tra trajectories. So that, that impressed me was how quickly those decisions were made to change yeah. the objectives of missions and uh, shuffle, shuffle things around at, the, at literally the last minute. Well, uh, yes, Apollo 8 especially. Just to remind, Apollo 8 is the uh, flight that went around the moon but did not land, and then they transmitted back uh, uh, readings from the, from the Bible. They're, they're well remembered for that. Uh, I was Capcom on, uh, on Apollo 8, which was sort of interesting, and uh, here it was, you, uh, you're about to have people leave Earth orbit to go to hypervelocity. First time in history, people were actually going to leave this little planet and actually uh, fly away from it. Wow. I thought, uh, surely uh, the president will be here at my right side. I saved him a seat at the console. <laughs> I said, surely the 
surely the Pope will uh, send a message. <laughs> I, I know Frank Sinatra will delicate, dedicate a song to this. And uh, instead of that, uh, Frank Borman and I had this, oh, wonderful, perhaps a little verbose uh, conversation. <laughs> you know, it, with all my uh, dramatic ability, I said, Apollo 8, you go for TLI. <laughs> But, you know, Borman met me halfway. He said, Roger Houston. That was it. No, you know, no drama, no nothing. No drama. But um, <laughs> as I look back on it, uh, uh, Apollo 8 uh, was an extremely important mission. It kind of got out of sequence, as, as Joe was saying, but extremely important, uh, perhaps in some mind more important than Apollo 11. The two flights are, are, are quite uh, similar, quite different. Uh, Apollo 8 was about leaving. Apollo 11 was about arriving. You know, 100 years from now, the historians, I'm sure, will have a brouhaha at the bar uh, about which of those two is more important, the, the leaving or the arriving. And uh, it's not for me to say, but as time goes by, I hate to be loyal completely to 11, but I think maybe the, maybe the act of leaving is even a little more important than the act of, of arriving. But anyway, they're both very good. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, so I think the folks would um, appreciate a little bit of insight into the training. So you had, obviously you had rendezvous and docking training, you had the lunar lander training vehicle uh, for the LEM. Uh, Joe, you were back up on 10, right? So what, what goes into the training as we're getting from 8 to 9 to 10 to 11, some of the unique aspects of how these vehicles flew. By the way, Joe, I heard you rolled the X-15, is that true? Maybe. Maybe? <laughs> Was it that general that brought you in and tore the thing up? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, there was a good reason for that. Oh, and, okay. <laughs> I mean, it made, it made sense. That's why I'm not at Leavenworth today. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, you didn't roll the OLTV, the train, the lunar land. No, no, okay. no, okay. no. Okay. No, I, I, it was my first flight in the X-15, and so, and it just handled so beautifully. It, it was just a, it was a wonderfully flying airplane when you stayed with, well within the envelope. <laughs> And uh, I, I was just feeling the airplane out. My, the first ride was a dollar ride. You only went to half throttle because they didn't want you to be overcome by G's. And, and, uh, and they were pretty impressive. But um, I was rolling back and forth, feeling it out. And it felt just like a fighter, just like a good fighter. And, and stable as everything in all three axes. And Bob Rushworth called and said, okay, Joe Henry, probably ought to look out the window and get yourself set up for landing. Because we didn't have any guidance, uh, no uh. navigation, no guidance in the X-15. Uh, and I looked out and I saw the dry lake bed uh, come screaming up underneath. And I'd not, God, I'd never been anywhere near that high or that fast before. And, and I saw the lake bed going by me and I thought, I could overshoot that sucker. And, and they didn't want to push over and get a negative angle of attack because then, then the airplane did get squirrely. So I just rolled it up and let the nose fall through. It did a sloppy slow roll and got the nose pointed down and uh, uh, then got the speed brakes out and got back into dense atmosphere. Got it slowed down and in. So I did it intentionally. But I did have to go up the chain of command with that story. You did, yeah. I really did. <laughs> had to go to Don Sorley, or the head of Don Sorley, the head of fighter ops at the time. He oh, said, sure. well, I'd have done the same thing, but you better talk to Tom Collins. And General Collins was the head of uh, flight test at Edwards. I told him, and he said, yeah, I'd have done the same thing, but don't, you, you, you're going to have to go see General Branch. <laughs> <laughs> So I went to General Branch, the same guy who tore up my application, and, called me and, said, and I, he made me stand there. He made you sweat. You know, I walked in and I stood at attention for a long time. He had some papers, and it turns out it was just a local newspaper he was reading. But he'd, he'd thumb back and forth, you know, and finally he said, "Sit down, Engel." I said, "Yes, sir." And he said, "Did you roll it?" And I said, "Yes, sir, I did." And he said, "What'd you do that for?" I told him, and he said, "Huh." Well, I'd have done the same damn thing, but you're going to have to go see Paul Bickle down in Nassau. 
I went to see Mr. Bickle, who was a glider pilot, had just set the new world's record for altitude in gliders. And, and Paul's gig was to sit back in his chair. He had this great big gut. He had a white shirt on every day, and he smoked a cigar. He'd, you know, flick the cigar, and the cigar ashes go on his shirt. You want to get up and come across the desk and wipe the cigar. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, okay, uh, Joe Henry. He called me Joe Henry. He said, did you roll the airplane on your last flight? I said, yes, sir, I did. And he said, why? And I told him, huh. And he said, I'd have done the same damn thing, but don't do it again. Everybody will want to do it. <laughs> and, uh, and sure enough, it turned out when, when, when they found out back at Ops, you know, that I wasn't going to get thrown off the base to roll in the X-15 on the first flight. Uh, they said, well, you son of a gun, I, I really wanted to roll that airplane, but now I can't. <laughs> but there wasn't any rule that said you can't. But, the answer is yes. Thanks for sharing that. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Joe. You know, but where I was going with that is the training that, that all gave us as test pilots to learn these machines that were in parts of envelopes that we'd never been before. That yeah. applied directly to what went on for training for like the, the low approach on 10 and the landing on 11. What, what did you use for different training devices uh, to do the, 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 the missions between 8, 9, 10, and 11? What, tell us a little bit about the training. Um, we, the, the, the trainer itself was a good, it was a good systems trainer. And it taught you the priorities of things you need to keep your eye close on during a flight and the things that you can use as a kind of a secondary failure that happens. But the landing training, the thing you're talking about, look, looking out the window, because you have no needles, no guidance, guidance with the X-15, to, to look out the window and just get yourself back over the runway uh, and then set up the approach and landing. We used F-104s because in the F-104, it actually is about the same length as, a, as the X-15, and the wingspan is not too much different. Uh, and if you came to idle with the 104, put the speed brakes out, put the flaps down to takeoff position, uh, and put the landing gear down. Then you could get it to fly almost as bad as the X-15 to glide. <laughs> and and uh, that was a really good trainer because we could go uprange to all the uprange lake beds, set up from different positions. As if, well, what if the engine quits here, you know? Yeah. Or do, I, do I try to stretch it onto the next dry lake bed or, or pull it around and get it? Get, get rid of the fuel and get into the one I'm over. And then down at NASA, Mike, when you were doing the dockings, you had, I, I would presume you had simulators just for doing the rendezvous and docking phase. When you were flying Columbia, you were the active piloting ship for the docking, is that right? How does that, how did that come about? Well, our, uh, our training was uh, exhaustive, uh, I would say. Uh, I, I think in the uh, command module uh, simulator, I had over 600 hours in that. So by the time we got airborne, um, things were, uh, were were not strange to us. I mean, the environment was strange, but the mechanical aspects of it were just like old so-and-so used to tell me, Collins, you idiot, don't do this, uh, you know, in the simulator. and. Uh, so it was um, the, the tasks that we were required to perform. Um, I don't know about the uh, the lunar landing and the uh, the descent and the touchdown. No, you'd have to ask Buzzer, and I'm sorry you can't ask Neil about that. But the stuff that I was in, in charge of was pretty simple stuff compared to what Joe was doing in the uh, X-15. When you do, so when we docked space shuttle, we used uh, the guidance and attitude hold for roll, pitch, and yaw, and all we worried about was translating up, down, left, right, and the speed in and out. Is it the same on? on I, I think it was, and you know, I had to I had to separate, and uh, and and that was pretty much, uh, you know, maybe I had to tweak the uh, readings a little bit, but then the turnaround was pretty much a computer thing, and then coming back in when you get within. Uh, you probably know better than I do from air to air refueling. Yeah. Uh, when you get into uh, yeah, 10 feet, 5 feet, 4 feet, then it's all, all our system at least was all mechanical. Yeah. You had to just get these two things lined up 
And it wasn't a difficult thing, but it had to be done without an error or you'd bounce off and, and then it would be much messier to try to get back into position. How about the, the lander training vehicle? When you backed up on 10, did you do some of that, Joe? The uh, no, I, I never got to fly So there. did either of you get a debrief from Neil's uh, training when he had to eject from the training vehicle? Did I did not get a debrief from I'm Neil. I'm sorry, I missed when, the question. When, when Neil had to eject from the LLTV, yeah. did he debrief the crew, you guys? Did Neil debrief you on the LLTV? No, no. I mean, Neil took kind of took that in stride. Uh, I mean, I'm sure he debriefed uh, the, LTV, uh, the LLTV people, but, uh, you know, he... he uh, so the story went, he went back to his office and his desk and picked up the administrative strands of his life as if the crash had never happened. And I don't know if that's true or false, but I would not be surprised if it were true. He kind of, he was a pretty cool character. He took things in stride. So um, people have n noticed that your Apollo 11 patch was quite unique. Um, can we show the patch from Apollo 11? Oh, I see it over your right so, shoulder so there. So, would you mind, so, um, when I, and Joe, you probably remember the shuttle patches, uh, the crews would take charge of figuring out what they wanted for a patch, and I had no artistic ability. I handed that off to somebody else, and I didn't worry about it. This is a very unique patch for many reasons, and no, no crew names on there, and people talk about the symbolism of that. How did you guys come up with this patch? Well, I guess it started with uh, with Gemini 10. Um, John Young's uh, wife really designed the patch and then uh, turned it over to the two of us. And between us, we decided that we did not want any uh, names on it, that uh, rather than uh, the two of us who were going to fly Gemini, we wanted to honor the... Uh, Later on, they called it uh, 400,000 Americans in the early days of Gemini, probably half that, but that's still a slew of people. You try to put 200,000 people's name on a patch. And so uh, we decided uh, to go without it, and then one thing led to another. I more or less designed the uh, Apollo 11 patch, and uh, same reasoning there. At that time, there were 400,000 Americans. And so I, I like going into Moker, you know, Mission Control yep. in uh, Houston. All is lined with patches, and I think, I'm not sure, but I think Gemini 10 and Apollo 11 are the only two without, without crew names. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any, uh, any memories about the surface of the moon from uh, orbiting that you'd want to share? Uh, no, I, uh, <laughs> I, 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 you know, I really don't. The, uh, the, the back of the moon is a little bit different. It doesn't have the maria, you know, the flat thing they call seas, uh, uh, terrain identical almost to that where uh, Neil was able to to put Eagle down, uh, it's it's more craggy, more beat up, uh, more f fissures, more uh, peaks that you don't expect, more of an uneven uh, surface. Uh, but you know the what do you expect? I don't know, little green men or something. It's pretty much <laughs> it's pretty much what you would expect, uh, having seen the front part of the moon. Just so, like I say, it doesn't have the Mari and it's a little more beat up, but uh, uh, you, you've seen the front and you almost have seen the back. And so, <laughs> so whatever. That's <laughs> fantastic. Right, thank you. So before you came out, we showed a video of the descent to the touchdown uh, with the alarms going off, 12.01, 12.02. Yes. And uh, what strikes me is how young everybody was in the control center. You had uh, Steve Bales and you had Jack Garman. Um, in the back rooms, they had a list of all those alarms. And for those of you who didn't uh, completely follow that, it wasn't a smooth descent. And they ended up with only 15 seconds of fuel, but they also were making these calls about do we go or do we abort and uh, it was some gutsy calls there uh, with guys like Jack and Steve 
instantly making a call that we're go. And, um, it, you know, 25 year old guys and uh, being that ready, it was pretty impressive. Anything uh, you want to share about that? Joe, you even mentioned that they gave him a special hat for his retirement with 1201 on it, I think, right? No, I okay. So, um, how did they? How did you get debriefed about that after the fact um, and how they went through that decision making process? Well, I, I was worried. I mean, I didn't, I was a 1201 and a 1202. I think I have those beat into my head and I wouldn't know one lunar module uh, uh, error code from another, trust me. But uh, I started scrambling through my bo uh, library and I had an extensive library to try to find the right book and the right page to find what was 1201 or 1202. And about that time, a uh, young guy in, uh, in mission control in Houston, had uh, he knew right away what it was, and he was willing to uh, stick his neck out a little bit, I think, and say, uh, and go, your, flight, tell him too. go. And huh? your neck, too. <laughs> yeah, oh, well. But uh, no, he was, he was willing to uh, say it was a go and and flight director trusted him and by that time perhaps the flight director and some other people were up to speed on the what implications of a, either a 1201 or a 1202 so down they went awesome um there's a photo that we have of neil uh, he had spent some time with us here at eaa as well um, back around the 2004 time frame and there's the photo of him uh, on stage with us right here um, and Neil came out and shared a lot of stories. This particular night um, we actually made a link to the space station, uh, audio link where we could talk to the crew on the space station and Neil um, spent the evening talking to us about the study he had done on the Wright brothers because this was the hundredth, just after the hundredth anniversary of the Wright brothers first flight. And what struck me about him is how he loved to talk about the airplanes and about the people he worked with and not so much about himself or, or his accomplishments. And, um, you know, um, we all cherish what you did as a crew. Uh, any memories you'd like to share with us for, about Neil and how you were as a crew? Well, I, th I think there were about uh, 30 of us who might have been considered uh, for that job. And uh, Deke Slayton, uh, who was the primary chooser, I'm sure he was not the only one. We had a whole center full of people, but um, I thought there could not have been a better choice. And Neil was a very intelligent man. He, um, he had uh, interests that were far wider than NASA's uh, space program. He was a uh, a historian, a native historian, primarily a historian of science. Uh, and uh, I, I can give you all kinds of examples, uh, but I, I, I'll give you one and then I'll give you a generality. After the flight of Apollo 11, we uh, were, uh, were thrilled to have a around the world uh, look at 29 different cities. Uh, Neil was our spokesperson. Whenever we arrived, uh, Neil made a short welcoming speech. Uh, he'd done his homework. He had the audience absolutely uh, eating out of his hand. He had all sorts of local references. And understand, none of this was any of the, in any of the briefing uh, papers that we had been given. This is Neil, Neil, and more Neil. At the end of the speech, he had the people eating out of his hand. They wanted to come on board uh, an eagle with him and, and fly with him. He was just am amazing in, in that regard. And um, I, I just think overall, he, he was just a magnificent uh, choice uh, uh, to be first man. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I think the next video clip we have pretty much shows that sentiment. Uh, this is a video of uh, when you all returned uh, in the command module coming back from the moon. And uh, let's go ahead and show that. Uh, the, 
No, we want the one that has uh, Neil in the command module on the return. Um, for just a moment. <laughs> um, we should have a video uh, of Neil in the command module during the return. There you go, right there. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> kind of. like yesterday, Mike? Does that feel like yesterday? Feels like 50 years, <laughs> uh, two weeks and one day uh, <laughs> since yesterday. Uh, fabulous, <laughs> thank you. Um, so you told a story last week we were together that I loved. It was about your time in quarantine and something about the, the white mice. You care to share that again? Mice? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> or them. Uh, yeah, I, I was I was fascinated. We were we were locked up in quarantine uh, b back in Houston for I think it was 14 days, uh, and um, and the reason was some of our scientists had thought that uh, perhaps we'd been exposed, uh, Neil and Buzz exposed on the lunar surface, to some really deadly uh, pathogens that were going to kill all of uh, mankind. I mean, the the chances of that were ex extremely small, almost infinitesimally small. The consequences, if true, were almost impossibly large. And uh, as Neil pointed out, if you multiply a huge number by a tiny number, we, what do you come up with? I don't know, something, some entity that had to be taken care of. So we were locked up in quarantine with, uh, I think, 30 or 40, I don't know, white mice. and. Um, <laughs> As I say, I think I said before, but the uh, the interrogations, if that's the uh, right word, that I got at press conferences uh, centered on one thing and one thing only. By yourself, weren't you the loneliest man in all the lonely history of the lonely earth in your lonely orbit behind the lonely moon all by your lonely self? Weren't you lonely? Oh, Jesus. I mean, I, <laughs> hey, I, I was, I was king of Columbia. I, it was all mine. I mean, uh, I, I had, well, like, like all kings, you have to be a little suspicious, like that third switch down there keeps popping out, whatever the hell it is either. I've forgotten, <laughs> but, uh. No, uh, so uh, uh, where, where was I? Oh, I was being asked uh, about, uh, about the mice. Uh, in quarantine um, with us were a large quantity, maybe, I don't know, 30, 40 of white mice, and uh, their, uh, their, their health depended on the, really the final outcome of our flight. Neil, Buzz, and I had flown to the moon, come back, 
That was either a wonderful success or the worst uh, uh, horrible tragedy in all of history, depending on the uh, health of the white mice. And, well, it's true, that's true, that's really true. And uh, um, so um, as, as time went by, well, at the time, I know what it was. At the time, I was reading a book by John Steinbeck uh, called Of Mice and Men. <laughs> And, um, yeah, and, 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 and okay, so we had flown to the moon and back, uh, but was, was that good or bad? Depended on the white mice. So as I got thinking of that, of mice and men, I decided, you know, the mice are really more important than the men on a deal like that. So that, that was my fantastic. conclusion. That's fantastic. Thank you. Um, this is another individual that uh, we owe a lot of credit to from the leadership of the program. That was Chris Kraft, and we unfortunately lost Chris on Monday, and uh, yes. we all knew him quite well. I'd like to honor him. There's a picture of Chris there. Um, thank you. It was, there it is. There's Chris. Chris worked to uh, advise us right up to the end. That's a photo of him a few months ago signing uh, some of our work on the next generation lander. Uh, North of Grumman is working on some of that today, and uh, Chris has been advising us. And so uh, we miss him. Uh, any? Would you like to share some of your memories of working with Chris, Joe, or Mike? Well, Chris was a brilliant, a brilliant man, and. Uh, uh, he, uh, he, he was just a joy to work with. He, if you were briefing even large groups of people and Chris was in the audience, he, he did not hold back. He would, he would ask you the tough questions. And it always seemed like he already knew the damn answer. You just could see <laughs> if you could answer the question. Um, but I admired him very much. I respected Chris. And uh, I... I didn't have any a whole lot of direct interface with Chris as far as taking or receiving orders, but but of course he was the leader at JSC, and uh, it was obvious that he was in charge, and nobody had any regrets about that that I can call. And Mike, you mentioned Bob Gilruth, and he and Chris obviously worked closely to lead there, right? Yeah, um, uh, Bob Gilruth was a little bit different than Chris and the people who worked in flight crew operations uh, division. Uh, the people in, in flight crew operations were, by today's standards, I think amazingly young. I think their average age was below 30. I'm guessing somewhere in the high 20s. But boy, they were competent. That's the one word I would grab and say they had a, a extraordinary high level of competence. You could trust them. They were very competent. Uh, Bob Gilruth was further up the ladder in terms of age. He was kind of like an old Teddy, not old, gosh, he must have been all of 50, but he was kind of an old teddy bear. And, uh, and uh, he left a lot of the uh, 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 decisions, I think, to the people who worked under him, or at least he allowed the general world to think that he had let them because he delegated a lot but he was a for the time for the place was a remarkable uh, leader but you'd have to pull it out of him to discover that he really was that uh, but together they were the yin and the yang the young and the old the, the both superbly competent and in the right job at the right time yes sir thank you uh, thoughts about the future, Mike? You talk about getting us to Mars and where we should be going. Give us your thoughts about the future program. Well, the, uh, the, the, the latest thing is to, is to set up various uh, facilities uh, on the moon, uh, an app, uh, a, a lunar orbit, a gateway, it's so-called, with some kind of a machine on the gateway pointing toward Mars and helping us along. And, and, you know, an awful lot of uh, science and an awful lot of uh, analysis has, has gone into that. Um, and Neil Armstrong didn't know about these details, but I did hear him say one time that he thought the voyage to Mars uh, was so complex 
that we uh, had some chinks in our knowledge and that they could be uh, filled by operations closer to home, closer around the moon. Um, so that seems to be where the country is going. I, I disagree. Uh, I, uh, I um, geez, I was in the, in the White House about four or five days ago, and President Trump listened to what I just got through saying. He said, Collins. I said, Mars Direct. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I just can't help it. I, uh, I, I would call it the uh, JFK um, Mars Express, because I hark back to John F. Kennedy, what he told us. Uh, He gave us our instructions, and, and his, his statement was a masterpiece of simplicity, manned on the moon by the end of the decade. And um, that was of immeasurable help to us. And not only, well, it galvanized the whole country, which is the more important part, but on, on a smaller scale, it, it gave us a, a wonderful uh, argument for getting uh, people to do what we wanted on schedule, on time. We could use his name. The, the end of the decade is coming. We're late on this. You got to get going on that. Get hot on the other. And, 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 I, and I think that that kind of a ga uh, galvanization of effort uh, would be immensely helpful in a, in a mission to Mars. And that's the kind of support we need, not only from the White House, but all over, from this country, from the planet, really. And um, I, I see uh, all those plans for returning to the moon, excellent plans per se, but I, I can project out into the future where they say, the, uh, oh, yes, of course we're going to Mars, but you don't understand. In the meantime, on the gateway, the umlaut doesn't fit into the overholt, and what are we going to do about the Frannis, you know? And uh, I, I just have the feeling it's going to delay things, and I'd, I'd like to sh take a shot at Mars Direct JFK uh, Express. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, we have a video now that everybody has seen, but I'd like to play it again as we close the evening, um, the landing when Neil stepped off the land. Let's do that. The surface appears to be uh, very, very fine-grained as you get close to it. It's almost like a powder. Now that uh, is very fine. Now I'll step off the land. It's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. All right, that looks beautiful. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. Let's hear it for Joe Engel and Mike Collins, everybody. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I apologize for being so deaf. Oh, shit. I am so deaf. I had just a terrible time, but I thank you for all the love. Oh, thank you. Jesus. Thank you. Right over this way. Well, you look like you do this stuff every day, Charlie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>